Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm just going to sort my screen out so you guys can see everything. Hopefully, that's working. Okay, hello, welcome. Um, please put your hi. Um, sort my screen out so I can start writing on it as well. So hello, welcome to uh, one of our A-level Sunday sessions. This is A-level chemistry, specifically acid-based titration, something that actually we do at GCSE uh, and A-level. So hopefully this is something that <coughs> uh, everyone is used to. Um, if you're here, please feel free to say hi uh, in the chat. It'd be lovely to see who's here and who's a returning person. So hi, Pascal, nice to have you here. Um, welcome if you if you this is your first Sunday session, maybe you're a year 12 student thinking you might get ahead over the summer, perhaps you're a year um, 11 student thinking you might have a look at what stuff you're going to be starting doing next year. But welcome. Um, welcome back. If you are a returning student, you've had some of these been to some of our sessions before. We do offer sessions in physics, maths, chemistry and biology. That's the one I forgot. Uh, and biology. So you may have been to one of those sessions as well. So keep an eye out on our schedule. Uh, if you're interested. Hi, Usama as well. Hello. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Absolute pleasure. So we're going to give it a minute or so um, just in case anybody else is appearing and then we'll get started. The way this will work is obviously um, if you, the more you engage, the more you'll get out of it. But um, if you would like to have a go at downloading today's slide so that you could try and uh, make notes along with me, or if you want to save those for the future, perhaps you're uh, um, going to use it for revision over later on in the summer or next year or whatever then it's a good idea so links should be in the description hi sophie welcome nice to have you here um so if you're interested please feel free to download today's slides and also after this session if you wanted to go back through our channel and have a look at older sessions we have got lots of web classes on there that you can go and have a look at um that you hopefully might find helpful with revision or, or getting to know a subject um hi audrey lovely to have you here as well so yes, please feel free to do that. Um, so like I said, this is a subject that actually we cover it at GSE. Um, we just have to go into a little bit more detail with A-level and they are looking for explanations a lot more than they are at GCSE. At GCSE, you are somehow expected to just be able to describe what's happening or to be able to describe a relationship. At A-level, we need to be able to explain that relationship. Um, and there's also a little bit more to do with uh, things calculations and um, using pH in a little bit more detail than you do at GCSE. So we'll go through the, all that today um, and see where we get to. So just to start off with a little bit about me, oh, if it'll work, there we go. A little bit about me. So my name's Alyssa. I've been teaching chemistry for over seven years now, nearly eight years, um, or teaching science, but chemistry is my favorite. Chemistry is my specialism, because I think it's awesome. Um, I have a PGC in chemistry or science specializing in chemistry for, from Oxford University. Uh, and I'm the lead chemistry teacher here at Snap Rise. So for this session, this next kind of just under an hour, we are going to look at uh, acid-based titrations and their uses. We're going to look at titration curves, which is something, again, which we don't really look at at GCSE, but we touch on a lot more in A-level to look at determining unknown concentrations. And we're going to look at titration curves to choose appropriate indicators, something which we find very difficult at A-level for some reason, until it clicks. It's one of those um, topics that can click, which is nice. We're not going to look at pH meters in too much detail. Uh, that's covered actually in a different web class of ours. OK, so this web class is aimed at all three specifications. So if you are uh, an APUA student, these are the spec points that we're going to be looking for at from your point of view. So that's, this is those spec points here. If you're an OCR student, these are the spec points from your specification that we're going to be concentrating on. And then Edexcel, these are yours. So if you don't already, it's a really good idea. If you're a year 12 going into year 13, or even if you're a year 11 starting, thinking about starting your A-levels, uh, the specification is such a good resource, which is very, very underutilized because it's literally a checklist of everything you need to know. So it's a really good idea to get comfortable with your specification, with what the words mean, how much they, um, they, how much detail they're suggesting you need, 
what kind of questions you could be asked, how much extra reading you might need to do outside of what's in your textbook, all of this sort of thing. You can find that in your specification. You just need to learn how to use it. So specifications can be so useful for students when they're doing their provision when they're, and when they're learning chemistry. Well, all subjects, but obviously chemistry specifically. OK, so hopefully we already know this, but this is something we need to know when we go into uh, A-levels and when we start looking at acids and bases. We should have a definition of an acid and a definition of a base. This is one that you should be could be asked for as uh, in the in the exam. So does anybody know? And I'm going to talk specifically about the Bronsted Lowry definitions because you could or you, know, you may see talk about Lewis acids and Lewis bases. That's a different way of defining acids and bases. We are concentrating on the Bronsted Lowry. Uh, way of defining acids and bases because uh, they've removed Lewis acids and Lewis bases from the specifications. So you may see reference to them in, in old specs or in old questions, but it's no longer part of the specification. They are only interested in Bronsted Lowry definitions. Um, so they may not call them Bronsted Lowry de definitions, uh, but this is what we should be describing. So, what is an acid? How do we uh, define an acid? How do we define a base then? What definitions are students looking for? Good, brilliant, well done, Sophie. A acids are a proton donor, very nice. Proton being H plus, very good. Um, so protons are H pluses, as in a hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms consist of a proton and an electron. That's all that exists in a hydrogen atom. We're talking just normal hydrogen, not deuterium or tritium or anything like that. So normal hydrogen just consists of a proton and an electron. There's no neutrons. So if we remove that electron to make it an ion, we are just left with a proton. And that's why we describe hydrogen ions as protons, because it is just a proton. So acids can be proton donors, i.e. H plus donors. For example, let's say we have our acid HCl. It can donate an electron. Uh, we can donate an electron to form H plus and Cl minus. Now, I have made it a reversible uh, process there, the dissociation or the ionization there. I have made it reversible. Technically, we describe HCl as a strong acid, so you may choose to show that as an irreversible reaction, but we can describe it as a reversible reaction as well. Technically, it is reversible. Um, so it depends on our context as to whether or not we would describe it as reversible or not. But in this case, I am. So if acids are proton donors, what are bases? If acids are proton donors, what are bases? How would we describe bases? What's the Bronsted Lowry definition of a base? Anybody know? And do we know? What uh, can we think of an example? Yeah, lovely. Well done, Sophie. A proton acceptor. And again, when we use the term proton, we're talking about H plus ion because it is literally just a proton. For example, maybe we could talk about sodium hydroxide accepting a proton. And that would reversibly form. Winter. Um, we haven't got the other half of the acid, so we don't know what the rest of the salt would. Didn't mean to do that. We don't know what the rest of the salt would be. So I'm just going to put it as an A plus. There we go. Okay, and then how do we determine molar mass? What's the formula? What's the equation for determining molar mass? This is the most basic, most useful one. How do we work out molar mass? So often we describe molar mass or we use the um, formula MR to talk about molar mass. If you know the definition of molar mass, we know that the definition is the mass per mole of a substance. 
So if we know mass in grams per mole, we know it must be mass in grams per divided by moles in mole. So the molar mass formula is mass over mole. So it's also useful to have that one in your head. And actually, we could also talk about, you know, making sure we're confident with concentrations, uh, moles in moles, or volume in decimeters cubed. So concentration is mole per decimeter cubed. That's also a useful formula to know as well. Okay, let's have a think about titration curves themselves. So when we're doing a titration, technically you could be putting your acid into your base or you could be putting your base into your acid. It entirely depends on what your unknown is. So we could either be we could either have our acid in the burette or we can have the base in the burette. So good thing to do is to double check what how the question is written if you're being asked a question about it or whether or not there's any hints um, as to which is the unknown or which isn't the unknown. So the unknown will always go in the burette and the known concentration will always go in the uh, flask, the conical flask at the bottom. So there are two common ways to do titrations and to work out pH, to work out when we get our, um, when we find our neutralization point or our equivalence point. Does anybody know what those one or two of those methods? So when we are looking to measure the concentration of an unknown acid or alkali, we can neutralize it with a base known concentration or vice versa. How can we, how do we know when it's been neutralized? How do we know that point? What are we looking for? How do we know the end point? What can we use? Anybody know? You may have done one or even both of these methods in class. So most, lovely, well done Sophie, the most common one is the indicator, it's adding an indicator. So we can measure pH change using an appropriate indicator, so when the indicator changes colour. Oops, appropriate indicator. Uh, when the colour changes. And I said appropriate indicator because we'll look at how to determine and uh, what an appropriate indicator is in, uh, later on. But we can look at when the colour changes. So for example, phenolphthalein is the one that's often used. Um, also, we look at methyl blue, uh, we look at methyl orange, we look at bromothymol blue, we look at... Uh, what's the third? This one. I can't remember what the other one that you may see at A-level is, but phenolphthalein is the one that you're probably most common, most um, used to, because it's one of the, it's the indicator that we use when we're looking at HCl and sodium hydroxide, the titration between those two. The other way of noticing uh, the pH change or for recognizing the pH change is using a pH meter. So we're not going to go into the methods of this, it's covered in a different web class, but um, you can also use a pH meter to measure the pH. Okay, okay. So, if you actually did measure the pH using a pH meter, you could plot it on a graph and you would create a titration curve. If you plot the volume of, if we're doing an acid base titration, we'd be adding base. No, that's a base acid titration. Um, if we're adding base, we will plot the volume of the base added against the pH that we measure after every uh, addition, and we would get a pH curve. So on the pH curve, there are a couple of things that we can recognize. How do we recognize the equivalence point on a curve? How do we recognize the equivalence point? On a pH curve. What uh, graphical aspect is the pH curve? 
sorry, that didn't make any sense. What graphical aspect is the equivalence point on our pH curve? Anybody know? If we look at the beginning of the graph, this is when our solution in our conical flask is acidic. As we continue to add our base, we get minor change in pH, but eventually we get very strong change in pH, and then our pH measures as basic once we've added a significant volume of acid, a uh, base, sorry. This horizontal section is the equivalence point. That shows us where the equivalence point. Good, yes, the middle of the horizontal, not horizontal, vertical. That's vertical, is it up and down? Vertical, middle of the vertical section, sorry. Yes, good. So that shows us where the equivalence point is within that section. Now, technically, the equivalence point would be exactly halfway along that equivalence point. So it's within that steep section, and that's what we use, that steep section, to recognize the volume that's necessary to reach the equivalence point, to reach the end point. Now, definition-wise, people sometimes make a mistake about what the equivalence point is showing. It doesn't necessarily show the point at which you have the exact same number of moles of acid and alkali. It might do in some cases, but it doesn't necessarily. Because if you have got a very strong acid and a weak base, or a strong base and a weak acid, or whatever, uh, you don't want exact molar equivalents of acid and alkali, because or acid and base, because they won't neutralize each other exactly. Also, if you've got a monoprotic at uh, acid and a diprotic base or vice versa again you don't want exact numbers you don't want the one to one ratio of acid to base because they won't neutralize each other exactly so what the equivalence point actually shows it shows when we have the correct ratio of moles the correct oops that's supposed to be a t the correct ratio of moles according to the balanced equation. According to the balanced equation for neutralization. Equation. E.g. with HCl and sodium hydroxide, it would be one to one ratio. So when we've added 20 centimeters cubed of our base, that means we have the same or correct ratio of moles according to the balanced equation between the acid and the alkali. Just to double check, it's the same for an acid. Again, the equivalence point lies in the middle of that steep bit, somewhere around there. I may have just missed, but it's approximately there. Uh, and again, that is our equivalence point. So it's the same, doesn't matter whether you're adding acid to base or adding base to acid, it's the same. Okay, if you have any questions, don't forget to ask them. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna have a quick look at how to calculate uh, concentrations using pH graphs. So the equivalence point can be used to calculate the unknown concentration of the acid or base. Let's say we have a reaction between neutralization reaction between HCl and sodium hydroxide. Actually, this is likely to be um, an irreversible reaction, so I'm going to put a full irreversible arrow in. It says a five mole per decimeter cube solution of sodium hydroxide is titrated into 250 centimeters cubes of hydrochloric acid. Work out the concentration of HCl. The equivalence point, if we look on the previous slide, let's pretend that this graph on the left is what's showing us uh, our equivalence point. That was at 20 centimeters cubed. That was when the equivalence point occurred. So our equivalence point is 20 centimeters cubed. Feel free to jump ahead. Can you tell me what the concentration of the HCl is? So if you can jump ahead. If not, we'll go through it slowly. 
So we know we had 20 centimeters cubed, which is a volume of sodium hydroxide, and we've got a concentration of sodium hydroxide. So if we've got a volume and a concentration, that means we can work out moles. So just a reminder, concentration equals moles over volume. If we've got concentration and we've got volume, we can work out moles. So moles of sodium hydroxide is concentration times volume, or you may remember it is N equals CV. We must make sure we've got our units correct, however, because nearly always when you're talking about concentrations and volumes, the volume will be given in centimeters cubed, but concentration is per decimeter cubed. So we must always remember to do a conversion of the volume into decimeters cubed. You could try and do the conversion of the concentration into centimeters cubed, but it's mathematically more complicated and therefore you're more likely to make an error. So personally, I think it's much better, especially in exam questions, they're likely to ask you to give concentrations in moles per decimeter cube. So let's just convert the volume to decimeter cube every time, and then we know we're not gonna make a mistake. So 20 centimeters cubed in decimeters cubed. How do we convert to decimeters cubed? Anybody know? How do I convert to decimeters cubed? A good one to memorize because it's a very, very common conversion. Usually, to convert from centimeter cubed to decimeter cubed, we would divide by a thousand. So that will give us. 0.02 decimeters. 20 centimeters cubed is 0.02 decimeters cubed. Okay, so then we can do concentration, which is 5 mole per decimeter cubed, times by our volume, 0.2 decimeters cubed. I make a habit, just as an exam technique, I make a habit of writing my units out. I know it's long and sometimes we don't know what the units are, but A, that's a good idea to try and work out what the units should be and get us used to using units. It's so useful. And B, if I've made a mistake, like I've forgotten to change my units, convert my units, when I write out five mole per decimeter cubed times by, if I were going to use 20 centimeters cubed, hopefully my brain goes, hold on, decimeters and centimeters, they're not the same. I need to do a conversion. So it's just another way of kind of helping to check your answer, check you haven't forgotten anything. So tangent those two together, I can also check, again, I can use my units to check if I'm doing de per decimeter cubed times by decimeter cubed, that means they cancel and my end unit is going to be just moles on its own. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to work out the moles. So it's, again, a good way of checking that you aren't making, aren't about to make a mistake with your calculations. So. 5 mole per decimeter cubed times 0 0.2 decimeters cubed should be 0 0.1 mole. So that's moles of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.1 mole. In order to do most of these calculations, you need to know what the balanced equation looks like. In this case, it's been given to us. It's not always given to you. You should be able to write out balanced equations for common acids and alkalis or common acids and bases. So here it's a one to one ratio. Lovely, that makes it much easier because then we know our moles of HCl are going to be the same as our moles of NaOH, 0.01. Because again, we've got our one to one ratio. Therefore, final step is we can, therefore, we're looking for the concentration of HCl. We've got the moles. We were given the volume already. So concentration is moles per volume. So 0 0.1 mole divided by, again, we're going to need to convert into decimeters cubed. And we end up with 0.4 
microns per decimeter cubed as our final concentration. Does anybody have any questions? Please feel free to ask them in the chat. If not, it's a good idea for you guys to get used to, uh, as you're going through your revision, as you're going through your lessons, making a mental check, using um, a bit of metacognition to work out, are you understanding this? Are you following this? Is this something that you think you need to spend more time on? Is it something that actually you're quite happy with? Um, it's a good idea to kind of go back and check and see how you're thinking. What are you thinking and how are you thinking? So have a think about how confident you're feeling. Feel free to let me know as well. But it's a good idea to, you know, to, to make sure you're you're taking a second to recognise as you go through theory, as you do your revision, how confident you're feeling about that theory. So we can here do it as a, a, out of three. One, yeah, I'm feeling pretty straightforward about it. Two, it's all right. You know, I guess I can go at it. Three, oh my gosh, no. It's horrible. Okay, let's have a quick go at an exam question before we move on to looking at indicators. So here we go, we've got glycolic acid and thioglycolic acid are weak acids. Now you might read that first sentence and go, I don't know what glycolic acid is and I've never heard of thioglycolic acid. How on earth am I meant to do this question? You can do this question because it has told us that they are weak acids. And we know how to deal with weak acids. So we do know how to do this question. It says, glycolic acid reacts with bases such as aqueous sodium hydroxide to form salts. Again, it's given us extra information. It's told us that we do know how to answer this question. A student pipetted 25 centimeters cubed of a 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed glycolic acid into a conical flask. So that's in my conical flask. Glycolic acid, 25 centimeters cubed of a 0.125 mole per decimeter cubed solution. The student added sodium hydroxide from a burette. A pH meter and data logger were used to measure continuously the pH of the contents of the conical flask. The pH curve that the student obtained is shown below. So we have a burette. Look at my beautiful drawings, and that contains sodium hydroxide. It tells us, again, in the next bit, one mole of glycolic acid reacts with one mole of sodium hydroxide. So it's told us that it's a one-to-one -one ratio between those two, the acid and the base. Write the equation for the reaction that takes place in the titration. Everybody should be able to do this because we know when an acid reacts with a base, Acid plus base makes salt and water. We do that equation in key stage three. So we should know that equation. And if we don't, we need to learn those equations that you did at key stage three now. So acid plus base makes salt and water. Which acid is it? It's glycolic acid. It's given us the formula for it. We don't need to know it at all. We do need to know the formula of some common acids such as HCl, uh, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, nitric acid, ethanoic acid, methanoic acid. We do need to know those formulas. We don't need to know any other non-common acid. So, but, so this, hence this one has been given to us. So this has been given to us here, plus sodium hydroxide is our other alkali. Uh, Sodium hydroxide is actually a strong base, so actually the likelihood is it's going to be just a forwards reaction rather than reversible. And it's going to form salt and water. If you're ever unsure, do the water first and then see what you've got left. So the water comes from the OH from the sodium hydroxide and one of the hydrogens from the glycolic acid, and it's going to come from the carboxylic acid, not the alcohol. Alcohols can be ever so slightly acidic, but it's so minor compared to carboxylic acid, for example. So we're going to end up with, that's the negative part of our salt, then the sodium is the positive part of our salt, and that's the one-to-one -one ratio, so that's lovely. So actually even, no, actually we do need to know that, never mind. So it then says, determine the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of the sodium hydroxide. Again, feel free to jump ahead, see if you can work out the concentration ahead of me. 
otherwise I'm going to work through it fairly steadily. Now we're going to need some more numbers. If we're aiming for concentration of sodium hydroxide, we're going to need moles and we're going to need volumes. How are we going to do that? The other thing we can do as well, so there's two ways you can start this off, is we can look at the information we were given. We were given a volume and a concentration of glycolic acid. And it's a really good idea to get used to looking two out of three of those common equations. Here we've got a volume and we've got a concentration. So we can work out moles super easily if we've got everything we need. So we might as well work that out. And that's another good exam tip. If you get stuck and you're not sure where to go, and you know that there are moles and volumes and concentrations and stuff, find something you can work out the moles of. Because you may get a mark for it, depending on the structure of the exam paper, you may get a mark for it. But if you, even if you don't get a mark for it, it may help you to see how you can move forward through this problem. So moles of glycolic acid. Is uh, moles equals comp times volume. So 0 0.125 mole per decimeter cubed. Again, I'm going to do put the units in. I know it takes longer, it fills up more space, but I can then see ah, I'm about to write 25 centimeters cubed, but I should be in decimeters cubed. So let's convert it. 25 over 1,000. That means our moles of glycolic acid are 0 0.003125 moles. How does that help us? What can we do next? Well, we've got a balanced equation, we've got a reacting ratio. So that means we should be able to do, we should be able to work out moles of sodium hydroxide. We know the ratio with which they react. We're looking for concentration of sodium hydroxide, so we need moles and volume. So let's work out the moles then. Should be the same, 0 0.003125 moles. I personally don't like to round anything until I get to the end, especially if you can keep the numbers on your calculator, because it just means you're less likely to have a rounding error or round too early. Uh, and end up with, it, with an incorrect answer at the end. I know it does mean <laughs> that you end up having lots and lots of numbers, but if you feel the need to round, work out how many significant figures your answer needs to be and give all of your rounded answers to one more than that. So you know you're not going to pre, uh, like, um, what's the word? Um, prematurely round. Okay. So I've got my moles of sodium hydroxide. I now need to know concentration of sodium hydroxide. So how am I going to work out the volume of sodium hydroxide? What information am I going to use to get the volume? Anybody know? Going to use my graph. I knew that the moles of sodium hydroxide and glycolic acid were one to one at the equivalence point. So I need to know the volume at the equivalence point. So using my graph, I can work out the volume at the equivalence point because first I identify where the equivalence point lies. It lies on the vertical section, within the vertical section. So probably about there-ish. And the vertical section lies at 22 centimeters cubed, 22.0 centimeters cubed. So that means I know my volume. So concentration is equal to moles over volume. I've worked out my moles, just found my volume, but it's in centimeters cubed, so I need to convert it to decimeters cubed. gives me an answer of 0.142 moles per decimeter cubed. Okay, if anybody's not happy, feel free to chuck an answer, uh, chuck a question, sorry, in the chat. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the next section. 
okay choosing an indicator this students often find this quite difficult until it's clicked and then you realize actually hopefully it's not that difficult so appropriate indicators need to have three things they need to have a distinct don't ask about distinct, distinct color change by that i mean we can't use universal indicator as an indicator for an acid-base titration because it doesn't have a distinct color change it has a graduation of color changes it has a gradient of color which means we're not going to know when the color changes okay we're not going to be able to determine when that point has been hit when the end point has been hit so we need one as a distinct color change that is either one color or the other now, of course, there might be a little bit of um, mixing of colors within our indicator if things haven't been stirred properly or if there is a reaction still occurring. But we would like an indicator that changes, def that definitely changes color and definitely, as in specifically, precisely changes color. In order for it to be appropriate for our reaction, we need to make sure that the end point or the color change occurs across the equivalence point. So the end point or the color change of the indicator must occur across the Equivalence point. Can't spell equivalence. Equivalence point. Again, of the reaction. By that, I mean, oops, spell that right. Okay, again, by that, I mean. Wherever the equivalence point is, wherever you see that steep bit of the graph where the pH jumps, the indicator must change colour within that jump so that we don't end up having a confusing colour change or even the colour change happening before the equivalence point has occurred. So the end point or the colour change of the indicator must occur across the equivalence point of the reaction. We'll look at some examples on the next slide. And there should be a sharp color change. So as well as there being a distinct color change, not a graduation, there needs to be a sharp color change. One drop should be enough to cause the color change. Okay, so here's some examples of some titration of some indicators that you may be familiar with, or you should be familiar with. Phenolphthalein, which has a relatively high color change or endpoint. Um, Bromothermal blue, which sits nicely in the middle, and methyl orange, which sits at the bottom in the acidic area. These color changes, these aren't exact numbers, but methyl orange is our Kind of acidic color change so when you're you have a, a color change that's uh, sorry, an equivalence point that's quite low in ph bromothermal blue is fairly neutral with its color change which is quite useful and phenolphthalein can be used when you have got a higher equivalence point like that, equivalence point that occurs at a higher ph in both cases or in all three cases our um Color change, no, our equivalence point is sitting across the color change. As in here, if we look at methyl orange, for example, our solution will be orange or red, or red actually, isn't it? Our methyl orange will be, our indicator will be red. Once the equivalence point has occurred, our solution will look yellow because in that jump, the color change has occurred. Okay, let's look at this. Oops, let's look at this in a bit more detail. I'm just trying to rub that out. There we go. Okay, so if we look at these titration curves and indicators, we should be able to determine by labeling this one as A, B, C. 
C and D. Which indicator is more appropriate or which indicators are appropriate, I should say, actually, for each of these titration curves, each of these titrations. So for A, could we use either phenolphthalein or methyl orange or both for this, do we think? Anybody got any ideas? Can we use both, either, neither, just one of them? Which indicators could we use for this titration? And why? Does anybody know? Could we use phenolphthalein? For A, we definitely couldn't use phenolphthalein because the colour change occurs after the equivalence point. Think about the pH, it starts up with acidic, it jumps, we go past our equivalence point, and then it becomes uh, basic. That means we end up with uh, our solution is going to be constantly colourless. If our solution is constantly colourless, then we've missed our in, we've missed our endpoint. We would continue adding um, our base, continue, 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 and then we might get an ever so slight colour change. We might start with a colour change, but we've gone way past our equivalence point at that point once we start getting a colour change. So phenolphthalein would not work as an indicator. Methyl orange, however, just would you would work. Because as we get to our equivalence point, as we get to our jump in pH, as soon as you added that last drop of your base, you would get a jump in pH. It would jump all the way up here and you would get your colour change. So here we would see orange. As soon as you add that last drop, you get the jump and you would see the solution as yellow. So that would be a suitable indicator methyl orange would be a suitable indicator for this titration. What about for B? What about for B? Think about the colours and the colour changes. What do we think? So if we look at where the equivalence point sits and where this, the, um, the end point of the titration and the vertical section of the graph sit, it sits after the colour change for methyl orange and before the colour change for phenolphthalein. So in both cases, they would not be appropriate indicators for this titration because neither of them sits across the equivalence point. For C, oops, I switched to C. For C, uh, ooh, pressing buttons, I shouldn't be pressing. Which one would be appropriate, do we think, if any? Look at where the colour changes occur. Look at where the titration is. Sorry, where the titration curve sits and where the vertical line sits. Phenolphthalein sits, the colour change sits across that vertical line. Means, again, as soon as you add that last drop of your base, the pH shoots up, the colour change occurs, and we know to stop the titration. So phenolphthalein would be a, a perfect indicator for this reaction. Methyl orange, far too low. The colour change has already happened before we've added more than about 10 mil, oh, sorry, 10 centimetres cubed of our base. So methyl orange, not a useful um, indicator for this titration. And then finally, the last one, well, it's got a very large equivalence point because here we've got a strong acid, strong base. We've got a very large, long um, end point. The pH change is very big. And therefore, actually, we could use either. Because again, as we add the last drop 
of our indicator, sorry, of our base, large drop of our base, you're going to get a super quick shift in pH, super high shift in pH, and that means you're going to see the colour change. So both of these would work as indicators. So just to confirm, something that you can think about in each case is what are you adding and therefore what does the graph look like? So we do do a whole other web class on graphs, but it's worth having a quick look now. So here we've got quite a low starting point. So that must be a strong acid, low pH of a strong acid. So here we're adding, uh, oh, I should do the other way around, actually, shouldn't I? We are, we're ending up with, a, it's not a very high pH for our base, so that must be a weak base. Uh, and it's being added to our strong acid. Let me know if you're not happy about how we work that out. For B, they both look very weak. You've got that characteristic curve at the beginning of the graph to show that it's a weak acid to begin with. And then we've ended up with a weak base of our low pH, so weak base added to weak acid for B. C, again, we've got a weak base, but we're ending up with a strong base. Sorry, start again. We started with a weak acid, apologies, I misspoke. Weak acid, because it's got that low pH, but it's not too low, and you've got that characteristic curve of the bottom where it's acting as a buffer. So if you've done buffers, that's where actually we can see it's acting as a buffer. Uh, so we are adding a strong base to a weak acid. And then our final one is strong base added to strong acid because we started at a very low pH, a strong acid, and we're finishing at a very high pH, a strong base. Hello, Troll. Apologies if I've entirely said your name wrong. Welcome. So that's our titration curves and indicators. This is the bit the students tend to find hardest, but just think about when you're going to get your colour change and whether that is a useful colour change. Think about adding that last drop to get the shoot up in pH as you add that final drop and you get the equivalent, suddenly you've neutralized all of the acid and you've suddenly got more base than acid. That's when you're gonna get a shoot up in pH if we're doing, if we're adding base to acid. Uh, so does that sit across the color change or not? Okay, again, good idea just to check your confidence levels and have a think. And then we're gonna answer some questions. So the titration curves labeled E, F, G and H for combinations of different aqueous solutions of acids and bases are shown below. All solutions have concentrations of one mole per decimeter cubed. For this part of the question, write the appropriate letter in each box. For the curves E, F, G and H, choose the curve produced by the addition of sodium hydroxide to 25 centimeter cubed of ethanoic acid, ammonia to 25 centimeters cubed of hydrobromic acid and hydrochloric acid to 25 centimeters cubed of potassium hydroxide. Anybody know for parts one, two or three, which letters are representing those graphs, those additions? Feel free to put I and then your answer, II, then your answer and III in your answer. And if you're not sure, how can we work it out? What do we know? What can we uh, deduce from the information we've been given? And how does that help? So I think a good place to look is at the graphs themselves versus what information we've been given about the uh, acids and bases. Sodium hydroxide to ethanoic acid. The other thing I'll say actually before we do that is most of the time exam questions have been written in a way where they help you through the question. So if they ask you in this case to do I first, it's a good idea to do I first because the likelihood is that will help lead you through the rest of the answers. 
sometimes you may choose not to and it may not help you to but exam questions have been written in a way to help guide you through the answers and they show you what to start with they show you the information to start with by presenting it to you first so in this case start with i then move on to i then move on to i and you may find it helpful so in this case what have we got we've got sodium hydroxide and we've got ethanoic acid now we should know whether or not those are strong bases or acids off by heart these are ones we do need to, to memorize sodium hydroxide is a strong base we should know that that should be memorized ethanoic acid is a weak acid we know it's a weak acid um, because when we look at it in questions we're usually given ka which shows it's a weak acid if you're not ka is yet don't worry too much but that is an indicator that it is a weak acid so we're looking for a strong base being added to a weak acid which means we need to start with an acidic ph so that already discounts h for me so that's good and then i'm looking for a strong base so i must end with a strong base because it's added i'm adding the strong base so i must end with a strong base so that gets rid of f because that's a weak base it's lower so e and g being added to a weak acid well there's my characteristic weak acid curve so it must be G for that first one. Part two, I, I. Ammonia is being added to hydrobromic acid. Now, I may not know hydrobromic acid. I probably haven't met it before, and it's not one of those that I actually am expected to know. But I do know that ammonia is a weak base. And I know that hydrobromic is just an acid. So again, I'm adding a base to an acid. So again, I can discount H because that's adding an acid to a base. And I'm looking for a weak base. So actually, it doesn't matter if I don't know whether hydrobromic acid is strong or weak because I can discount E and G already. So it must be F because I'm looking for the final base to be a weak base. So that makes that easier as well. Again, this is why they've led us through it. Finally, hydrochloric acid to potassium hydroxide i should know both of these hydrochloric acid is a strong acid potassium hydroxide we should know because it's similar to sodium hydroxide is a strong base but again even if you don't know that it's a strong base because it's not one of the ones you should know but we should be more used to it and we should be able to work out that it's a strong base even if we don't know it's a strong base i'm adding an acid to a base there is only one option and that is H. So again, even if I don't know what potassium hydroxide, whether it's strong or weak, I can do this question because I've got all the information I need. Okay, the final part of this question is that the student decided to carry out this titration using an acid base indicator. What important factor does the student need to consider when deciding on the most suitable indicator to use for this titration? So this is our indicator factors. We've only got one mark, but there are uh, a couple of things we could say here. The key, though, is that colour change within the equivalence point. So there should be a sharp, good to use the word sharp, colour change. Or you can use the term end point there if you want. End point within the, oh, that's a funny Q, within the equivalence point. Or you can talk about the vertical section on the graph. mark okay final exam question is this one again same graph so don't worry about rereading that first section because i'm telling you it's the same part of the exam question but part b of the question asks us to determine which indicator on the table could be used for the titration that produces curve e but not for the titration that produces curve f so I'm going to just scribble out G and H for us for now. If we're not interested in those. Which indicator in the table could be used for the titration that produces curve E, but not curve F? So let's look at the differences between them. 
They're both with strong acids. The difference is that F is with a weak base, E is with a strong base. So we need an indicator that will change colour for a weak base, but not a strong base. Oh, wait, I was not that the wrong way around. Sorry, we need to use one for the strong base, not a weak base. Apologies. Otherwise, that'd be very difficult. Uh, so, again, what's the difference then? The difference is this top section that's not present in F. So, therefore, we need to look for a, an indicator that will change colour in the top section of that graph. The rest of it is identical between E and F. So, if you had an indicator that changed colour in my kind of scribbled over region, it would change colour on both E and F. So we need one that's only going to change colour in that top section for, of E. So let's have a look at our um, examples. We've got pentamethoxy red. That changes colour super low between 1.2 and 3.2. Far too low. Definitely not going to be pentamethoxy red because that colour change occurs far too low for any of them. So it's actually not useful at all for E or F. Naphthyl red changes colour between 3.7 and 5. So 3.7 and 5. Well, actually, in both cases, it would work as an indicator for either E or F, but it's not going to work as an indicator for E but not F because it would work for both. So actually, naphthyl red will work for both, so it is not appropriate here. For nitrophenol, 5.6 and 7, so between 5.6 and seven again it is likely to change color across both endpoints so not a useful indicator or not uh, it's a useful indicator for both but not to answer this question and then finally creosote purple has a high color change from 7.6 to 9.2 that is too late for our colour change for F, for our um, titration F. So creosote purple is good for E, not for F, and therefore that is our answer. Hello, hello. We're just coming to the end of our session now. So hopefully you should now be able to understand acid based titrations and their uses, how to work them out. We can use titration curves to determine unknown concentrations, and we've done an example calculation of that as well. And we should be able to use titration curves to choose appropriate indicators. Does anybody have any questions before I disappear? Please feel free to have a look at our um, timetable to see if there are any upcoming sessions over the summer um, and to keep up to date with that. And obviously, don't forget you can look back through the previous history of the channel and have a look at. Um, other web classes that we've done, etc. If nobody has any questions, then I will head off. Don't forget, if you do have questions, though, you can email hello at snapprovise.co.uk uh, to ask those questions, etc. And I hope to see you at a future web class. Thank you very much. Bye bye.